Uh, today, we're going to start at looking at the last week. Some of the information, it's, it's, we don't have enough context yet uh, because we have had two holiday weeks where a number of drive through testing locations have been closed and a number of, of other things have reported slower, like the major national labs. Uh, after that, we're going to talk about today's report, and then we're going to talk specifically about uh, vaccination. We're going to provide you uh, more, in fact, all of the priority groups uh, here in Kentucky. Dr. Stack's going to talk through our new goals because we got to get these things out faster. And I'll, I'll talk about That's that where a number of drive through testing locations have been closed and a number of, of other things have reported slower, like the major national labs. Uh, after that, we're going to talk about today's report, and then we're going to talk specifically about uh, vaccination. We're going to provide you uh, more, in fact, all of the priority groups uh, here in Kentucky. Dr. Stack's going to talk through our new goals because we've got to get these things out faster, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. I'm not okay with the pace that they are currently uh, being provided. And we have too many people out there that are rightfully anxious, and they need to see well, this whole country pick up the pace. We're certainly going to do it here in Kentucky. So let's start with our stair stepper chart. But it is going to take a little bit of time uh, to see this exactly last where the week uh, was uh, higher, certainly, than the week before, but of course lower uh, than our peak from, oh, about five weeks ago when we were seeing that exponential growth. It's hard to know how much of this week might otherwise have been in the week uh, before in the week uh, before, which we thought was, was uh, artificially low. Uh, but it is going to take a little bit of time uh, to see exactly where this trend is going. While in good news, uh, we think some of what we saw this last week was probably reports coming in again uh, from that prior week where you see the really big dip. We do have real concerns that people's behavior and, and getting together, especially over, over the Christmas holiday, in informal gatherings where masks are not uh, worn, will increase cases that we see over the coming weeks. And what that means is we just need the very best out of people moving forward. Uh, whether you did it right and kept things within your family or really small or, or whether you did it wrong, and did it in large groups where COVID spreads. We need your very best right now and in the months to, to come. Positivity rate. Uh, this is uh, concerning when you look at uh, this, this big jump. Now, there are a couple of things that we think are at work here. Uh, most of the testing where people who are asymptomatic get tested. And, and when you test asymptomatic folks, a smaller percentage of it have it than where you go if you're symptomatic. Because if you think you have COVID and you go to the hospital where, where most symptomatic folks go, well, that positivity rate is, is higher. A lot of our asymptomatic testing, including our surge testing from the federal government uh, and others, was closed numerous days uh, during the last two weeks. And what that would mean is, is the sites where the positivity rate is the lowest were not open as many days. Now, that probably doesn't account for all. Uh, of the growth that we see here. Again, part of it is probably Christmas, is, is how COVID spread in, in uh, some small uh, gatherings. Maybe we may continue to see this through New Year's. Now, we'll have to see from the data. I don't think the rise is this dramatic, uh, but, but we are probably seeing at least a rise in the positivity rate, something, again, we're going to have to follow uh, very carefully. Uh, when we look at the inpatient census, uh, it is up a little bit from where it's been the last couple weeks, but still in that general plateau that we hit uh, really in mid to late November. We're going to have to watch this carefully to make sure that that line going up doesn't continue to increase this week and, and through the next week. Um, ICU is just about uh, the same, again, increasing uh, over the last uh, week, certainly, but, but where it goes uh, from here, uh, again, we will be uh, watching. Uh, COVID patients on a ventilator, uh, we're up over yesterday. Again, we're down over several weeks ago. When we look at uh, the hospital capacity by region, which we've been showing you, that's that map. 
We've gone from two to four uh, regions that are in the red. You know, region 10, certainly a concern with 95.6% of the ICU beds filled. Now, obviously, if you just go um, over to, to four, while it's in the red, 83.3% uh, is a lot different than, than its, its neighbor. Uh, we have region seven, which is in the red for uh, inpatient beds, but not uh, ICU. And area eight, which has been in and out of the, the red, uh, again, for, for ICU. Uh, we believe we still have hospital capacity. Uh, this shouldn't uh, necessarily sound the alarm, but it should tell us that where we are continues to be fragile. That in just one week of not doing the things we need to do, we can give up gains that we fought and we sacrificed week after week to achieve. That's what this, this virus is. It just waits for you to get tired. It waits for you to let your guard down. And, and then it springs into action and can spread so fast, so fast that, that months worth of work can be wiped out pretty quickly. So let's remember that and make sure that we continue to do the things each and every day that we need to uh, to defeat this virus. Remember, we're going to beat it. We're going to win. The question is how many people we're going to lose along the way. How many people are going to have uh, long-term uh, symptoms and, and complications and difficulties coming out of it? How many of our young people may suffer from the mycocardia uh, that, that is, is afflicting um, uh, some of our young people? Now, how much damage is going to be done between now and when and when we have enough vaccine out there to, to reach immunity? I want to make sure that we keep that damage as small as possible, that we lose as few people as possible. That takes effort, uh, it takes commitment, and that takes continued resiliency. Today's uh, reports are, are higher uh, than the last several weeks. In fact, this is the highest Monday that we've had with 2,319 cases. Again, we'll be watching, uh, especially moving into next week, on how many of these Monday cases may have been uh, backed up uh, in the system from really two holiday weekends uh, in, in a row. Uh, currently hospitalized in Kentucky, 1,737. That's up. Currently in the ICU, 456. That's up. Currently on a ventilator, 216. That's up over yesterday. Again, when we saw that the, the trend line still down uh, compared to uh, other, other times. Uh, current positivity rate, 11.2%. We talked about this. We're going to be watching it. We can't tell you definitively uh, right now uh, whether that this has been, again, inflated by what testing is open or not, or as a result of, of uh, private gatherings over the holidays. We think it is some of both, but it's going to take days uh, to, for, the, for the data uh, to show us uh, the truth. New deaths today, a uh, hard day with 26 deaths. They include uh, two individuals from Boone County, a 79-year-old woman and an 81-year-old man, a 54-year-old woman from Boyle County, four individuals from Campbell County, three women, ages 73, 84, and 92, and a 72-year-old man, a 92-year-old man in Franklin County, a 70-year-old woman in Gallatin County, two men in Grant County, one just 40 years old and one 70 years old. In Jefferson, we lost four individuals, a 95-year-old woman, and three men ages 72, 78, and 92. In Kenton County, we lost one, two, three, seven individuals, uh, eight, 66-year-old woman, 74-year-old woman, 99-year-old woman, 102-year-old woman, 86-year-old man, and an 88-year-old man, and a 90-year-old man. In Lewis County, we lost an 82-year-old woman. In Marshall County, we lost a 65-year-old man. In Simpson County, we lost an 89-year-old woman and a 64-year-old man. New cases by county, Jefferson, 429, Fayette, 170, Boyd, 102 cases, Kenton, 80, Warren, 76, Pulaski, 71, Boone, 66, Bullitt, 59, Henderson, 59, Pike, 57, Oldham, 52, Logan, 51, 
You can find the rest on kycovid19.ky.gov. Long-term care, again, this is the reason that long-term care residents and staff are in the very first group because the magnitude of the loss there. 105 new residents testing positive, 126 new staff, 37 deaths, um, additional deaths attributable to long-term care. Folks, the only way that we can stop this now is to stop the community spread. It's what we are doing in our communities or what we're not doing. It's not following the rules and regulations enough, not wearing a mask, not engaging in social distancing, not being careful that ultimately costs the lives of individuals in these facilities. Please, these are, these are real people. And this is just in long-term care, 1,858 people that have passed away because we couldn't keep COVID out of the facility because of community spread. We just, we need to do better. And speaking of needing to do better, I think that's a fair way to characterize the vaccine rollout across the country. Number of things that I believe the federal government underestimated. First, the amount of time for each individual vaccination that's done. It takes um, signing somebody up and getting the consent form. It takes uh, asking several questions to ensure that you're not giving the vaccine to someone who might have a, a severe reaction or has had a fever, all those questions. Then it takes the vaccination itself and some form of monitoring for a certain period uh, thereafter. So this isn't something, when you think about that, what, eight to 10 minutes per individual at least, that one person working a normal work day uh, can hit the type of, of numbers that we need to hit uh, to, to get people vaccinated out there. I think a couple uh, of other things that were uh, underestimated by the federal government, and that's when uh, you have a really narrow first group, which we did, and I understand why, and especially on the hospital side, if each uh, vial has been allocated to individuals, uh, the, when the group is smaller, there appears to be less urgency to get it out to those individuals because you know that they're going to get one uh, because of, of the way it's been uh, set up. But we need to move faster. We need those that have already received the vaccine to move faster. We need our partners in long-term care to move faster. Uh, so today we're going to talk about some changes that we're making, uh, providing some additional clarification. So if we ever have one of those two stores, one in Lexington and one in Louisville, that thaw too much again, they know exactly what populations uh, should get it. And then you're going to see in the coming days, we're going to be pushing harder and harder and harder to get these vaccines in people's arms so much faster. And we're going to have to really be building up uh, larger operations that we can get more people uh, through. So let me be clear, I am not satisfied by the pace of vaccination here in Kentucky. While I think it is the same across the country, that's, that's not what, what, what I was elected to do. I was elected to do my best for you, the people of Kentucky, and we are going to do better. So let's look at what has been allocated. This doesn't mean it's been received uh, in Kentucky. We've gone over this before. So this was the amount that was allocated in December. Now, some of that last part of December is still coming in. So there is a difference between what's been allocated and what's been received as it is logged into the system. Let me also say we have delays in reporting in each and every part of this system. So I know when we talk about the number vaccinated today, it's higher. Now, groups that are vaccinating are supposed to report within 24 hours, every vaccination. That target is not being hit. And so we're gonna be communicating to each and every one of those providers that that is a must, and that is a requirement to get additional doses of vaccine. Uh, we have got to, to have better data, and that's from both our long-term care program uh, and what's currently the healthcare worker program. And we're not gonna stop until we have it. And until we have it um, um, daily, uh, what we will do right now is every Monday, we're going to provide a vaccine update. And, and uh, we, we are not going to be updating the vaccine numbers every day uh, online until we believe that they are accurate, until we've got that reporting coming in. 
We believe if we do it weekly right now, it can be accurate. And the moment we believe that we are getting those reports in within 24 hours, we will move back to daily. But we want to make sure that what we're telling you um, is, is as accurate as we can get it. So we have had two January allocations as well. One from Pfizer, the vast majority of this is going to long-term care. And when I talk about some numbers in a minute, you'll see that of the doses received by our long-term care partners, only about 20% have thus far uh, gotten into individuals' arms. But under the contract with the federal government to have this program going, to even have the vaccinations that are occurring right now, we have to send a certain portion to them. That means it's gonna be really important in our partnership with CVS and Walgreens that we do a couple things. One thing that we've already reached out is we are offering individuals, more people, including the National Guard, to supplement and, in fact, um, add to their teams. We want to make sure that we can multiply their man and woman power so we can do more faster. Uh, again, we, we, are, we have made that offer. Uh, we're going to push. I'll let you know when we get our response, how many teams that lets us add, uh, how that lets us impact our schedule. But I'm telling you in real time uh, what I've been pushing to make sure that we can move this thing uh, faster. Uh, so of uh, what's been allocated, our numbers as of today, uh, and again, there is a reporting lag. There is no question, is that um, about 174,000 750 doses have been received by either the long-term care program or the health care worker uh, program. And out of those, uh, and this was, I, I think, uh, accurate as of uh, yesterday. I don't think we'll get today's in until tomorrow. Uh, a total doses, and this should be total people, that have been vaccinated, 60,414. And... Jim, if you want to put that up. Now, let me break that down a little bit further. So a total uh, vaccine doses received, this is they've come in and they've been logged in uh, by the provider. On our healthcare worker uh, side, which are going to hospitals, they're going to uh, our local health departments, they've received 122,100, and they have already vaccinated 49,770. Three. So not enough, not enough, but certainly what, uh, over, over a third, maybe hitting uh, 40, 40%. Uh, we're going to reach out to each of these partners and talk about the urgency. And I know we've got healthcare providers out there that are concerned that they haven't gotten it yet. And I'd say two things. Number one, we need more urgency in this program by those providing the vaccinations. And we're going to work with them on that. But number two, if you're a healthcare provider, you are going to get this vaccine so much earlier than the rest of the population. So we really need you to set a good example on the patient side. Because what about that person who's going to have to wait two more months and really need it because they're vulnerable to this virus? For them, please set the very best example that you can. They're watching you. They're watching how you react. And so we need to make sure uh, that, um, that we're modeling that, that right type of behavior. Long-term care program has received 52,650 doses and has provided 10,641 vaccinations. Now, that's only about 20%. But you can look at the numbers a little differently. We believe 146 long-term care facilities have had the vaccinations done right now out of about 750. Uh, again, uh, we need the pace to increase here. We're providing more people. Uh, we're, we're pushing for better data on a day-to-day -day basis uh, from these partners. But uh, no question, no question, this has got to move faster, and we're going to make it, it happen. Um, some of the ways that we're going to do that, um, Dr. Stack is, is going to talk through providing more clarity, providing clear goals, uh, creating accountability, and, and then as we move forward, and we're not going to go through it all today, how we build out the system out there, uh, how we get more volume is something we're working on uh, right now. You know, we've, we've been in this a couple weeks, and we've already learned lessons, and we can't wait 
another month to start putting the newly needed infrastructure in place. When we learn one model doesn't work or doesn't move fast enough, we improve its efficiency, but we also look at other models we can uh, rapidly implement uh, to, to where we can get uh, the type of results that we need. So with that, Dr. Stack. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, Virginia. Can you hear me okay? So um, I'm gonna talk on two things real quick. Just very briefly, I think the governor wanted me to touch on where we are. Um, I think that the points he has made have already covered um, very well, that when testing was suppressed over the last two weeks, the people who probably didn't get tested were people who were lower risk. And so I think that can artificially elevate our positivity rate. Um, I will tell you that there are signs that perhaps the hospitalization numbers are increasing. Uh, so I am concerned that the activities over the two major holidays here, the Christmas and New Year's, plus the many other holidays that accompany the season, um, have probably resulted in some increase in disease. We will know that better over the next one to two weeks as we see what the positivity rate does when testing volume again increases, and we'll also see what happens uh, with the hospitalization data. So I'm going to, again, beseech all of you. I'm going to ask you as uh, personally and um, you know, passionately as I can, please wear your mask, stay six feet or more away from each other, wash your hands, stay home if you're sick, and uh, get tested if you think you've been exposed or have COVID. So please, we've got to do these things to block and tackle until we get enough people vaccinated to get to a better place, which won't happen until later this year. Um, I'd now like to turn our attention to the vaccine rollout. And uh, Jim or James, thank you very much. This is the uh, phase planning for all the rest of the population. I'm gonna go through three slides um, and then I am gonna turn around and put this in a bigger perspective. So phase 1A was already defined. Uh, essentially, all the states followed ACIP's guidance. That's the CDC's advisory committee. That's long-term care facilities. And as the governor said, we've activated CVS and Walgreens fully and given the full allotment required to activate that as robustly as the federal government provided to us. Uh, even so, we're working and trying to take steps to see if we can accelerate that further but we're still hopeful that all the nursing home population will be vaccinated both first and second dose by March 1st. That's what we were led to believe at the start. And I think they can still get that done. If we can do it faster, that's even better. 1A also includes healthcare personnel. Folks, I'm a physician. For 20 years, I worked as an emergency physician after all my training. I know it's frustrating. It feels disempowering, not knowing where to go and how to get things. Uh, we're working on that. Um, we, there weren't systems in place to sort all of society in discrete little buckets and line them up single file and march them through in, in a certain order. It didn't exist. And it's a really daunting task. So the month of January is going to be a progressive ramp up to reach and identify healthcare personnel in a very generously described uh, paradigm. So in, in a memorandum I sent out to all healthcare personnel uh, a week or so ago, it describes healthcare personnel as being any individual, regardless of their role, who works in a patient care setting. That could be in a hospital, a doctor's office, a dentist's office, a physical therapy office, a home setting. If you go out to home, it could also be a mortician who's dealing with deceased individuals. It can also be people who deal with human tissue and uh, fluids like laboratory personnel, uh, behavioral health individuals. It is intentionally a very generous, permissive definition. It includes healthcare professional students. The challenge again is there was no way to have all of the healthcare people identify who they are and then have a designated place to go get vaccine, particularly when there are small quantities of vaccine in the first weeks and all of this was happening over the holidays, the, the end of the year holidays, where it is really, really hard to get stuff established. And remember, we need healthcare people to be the ones who do the immunization. And part of the challenge there 
as you all know, is it's been a hard year for a lot of the healthcare persons who have had to do so much extra work this year to help us get through COVID. So in the month of January, that should escalate and ramp up. And I'm confident the vast majority of healthcare personnel in our very generous description of it will have access to the vaccine as the month of January unfolds. 1B has already been defined. The governor announced that, um, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. This is first responders, so police, fire, uh, anyone over the age of 70 or 70 or older, and the K through 12 school personnel. First responders are already being immunized in many communities, <clears throat> along with the Tier 1A, um, and I think that that will get done hopefully very quickly here in January. Uh, people 70 and over have not yet had any kind of general access to the vaccine. That will be built out here, and you will start to see that you begin to get access to that in the weeks ahead. Again, I, I would like to be able to respond to all your emails and outreaches, but the bottom line is this stuff is all being worked on and built out as we go, because remember, we had two new vaccines that came out on December 14th and 21st, right before the end of the year holidays, with new guidance for both. They were special storage conditions, difficult to handle, required a lot of information to be shared. There's a lot of moving pieces. And so the whole country struggling with this, but I agree with the governor. Um, I want you to understand why it doesn't happen just as quickly and easily as people would like. But I want you to hear that we are committed to getting this done quickly, efficiently, and in the best way we know how and are able to deliver. And we're committed to ramping up the pace dramatically. Phase uh, 1B also includes K through 12 school personnel. Because there are school nurse programs throughout the state, because there are relationships between schools and their local health departments, this is going to be a designated program. So folks, if you're in the K through 12 school personnel bucket, hold tight. The governor has already said that this will be late January, close to February 1st is when we'll roll this out and we'll figure out as quantities allow how over a few weeks we try to go out and vaccinate across all the districts across the state. So please just hold tight in order to deal with that population as a separate category. It takes extra planning and making sure we have the quantities we need at the places they need to be so that that can happen. But we are working on that now and there will be more guidance in the next couple of weeks on that. Now, for the first time today, you're seeing in Kentucky our Category 1C, 2, 3, and 4. <clears throat> 1C aligns with what the CDC had said for all the rest of 1B plus 1C, and we even lowered the age. So 1C is people 60 and over. People who are 16 and over with any of the highest risk uh, COVID-19 conditions, that, that is published on the CDC website. Um, and all essential workers, as listed by the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, that is on their website, and we've, I'm going to show it in a third slide. By the time we get to phase two, that's anyone 40 or over who wants to get vaccinated, and by the time we get to phase three, it's anyone 16 or over, uh, because uh, people under 16 are not eligible for the vaccine now because they're not authorized by the FDA. And, uh, and so people under 16 are in category four because they're not even eligible to get this. And that's probably about 18% or so of the population, which is over 800,000 people. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please. So because focusing on priorities is important to try to get the highest risk people, um, we're still going to ask every vaccination, vaccination site to use the priorities and stick with that. But if we're trying to keep people out and say we only do people in a certain category at a time, now we're slowing ourselves down. And what happens is we have some people who have vaccine and need to use it, but they're not able to use it because they say, well, the rules say we can only vaccinate these certain folks. So we're going to set the top level goal. The high priority here is for every vaccine administration site in the state, Whatever vaccine you get each week, the expectation is you will have administered 90% or more of it within one week of receiving it. 
The goal is to not have vaccines sitting in a freezer. The goal is to have vaccine administered to willing recipients who want to have the vaccine. So for all the rest of the general public, this means a site is still going to prioritize 1A, 1B, 1C, 2, 3. However, it does mean that someone who is 45 and has no medical problems may get vaccinated before someone who's over 70 and has a medical problem. It means that someone in the general public is going to get vaccinated before someone who's a healthcare personnel gets vaccinated. We're still going to prioritize and start at the top of the pyramid every week. We're going to ask every site, schedule your vaccine for people who are at the highest tiers, but the goal is not to have it wait and hang over till the next week. It's to administer it and use it. And then when you get the next shipment, start over again with that process. If we get only the conservative estimates for the vaccine we are currently slated to get, um, and we had a good uptake rate of over 80%, we would still get more than half of every interested Kentuckian vaccinated by the time we reach June. Since we have increasing uh, volume of vaccines projected, and since we'll almost certainly have a third or maybe even a fourth vaccine approved over the next few months, that timeline will move further forward. So the goal now is to give it quickly and to focus a little bit less on who is getting it and prioritize getting it out as fast as possible to as many people willing to have it. And if we could show the next slide, please, it's the last one. This is just to show you how many different individuals are included in phase 1A, 1B, and 1C. CDC uh, defined in various ways who are essential workers, and they said 87 million Americans fit in the essential worker bucket, both frontline essential and other essential, plus I put healthcare at the top, which is another 21 million. So the left column shows you 98 million Americans by the estimation of the CDC. The right column are the people who are have conditions who have been proven to be at increased risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Those individuals um, I don't have a number for you. They said over 110 million Americans have medical conditions that may make them at risk for COVID-19. It's a slightly larger bucket. So here are the points I want to leave you with. We got to pick up the pace. And I think that the pace is going to escalate dramatically starting this week and going forward. I, I can't underestimate the impediment it was to have so much new stuff, so much uncertainty in quantities new data systems, end of the year major holidays, and an exhausted healthcare workforce, all of this coming together in the first two weeks of the rollout. I am convinced that it's gonna start to escalate more quickly this week, and then we are gonna take additional steps that we'll announce at a future date where we are going to work to create a way where any individual Kentuckian who wants to get vaccinated can identify themselves, and we can try to identify for you a place to go to get vaccinated. Doesn't mean it's always going to be exactly where you want it or exactly when you want it. But the goal is to try to make sure that when vaccine is delivered to the Commonwealth of Kentucky, we distribute all of it and administer all of it into people who want to receive it. Every week it comes in as quickly and efficiently and as safely as possible. And we are committed to getting that done and are gonna be taking more steps over the next few weeks to make sure that that can happen. So folks, we've been through a lot. I hope what we've been able to show here, one of the things I'm very grateful to the Governor Bashir for and the many colleagues in government I work with, is I think in Kentucky, we have demonstrated throughout this response all the way from before March 6th forward, that we pay attention, we learn from things that are done well, learn from things that are not done as well as we want, and we iteratively improve. So today the strategy has changed because of the lessons learned over the last few weeks so that we prioritize getting these shots out to people who want them and doing it as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So Governor, thanks. This was an expansive or a longer time frame here. Uh, thank you very much, but I hope that this helps provide additional assurance to Kentuckians that you'll start seeing this pick up significantly here in the immediate next few weeks. Uh, back to you, Governor, thank you very much. Thank you to, to Dr. Stack. Um, and just to, to, to be clear, can we put 
back up the vaccine update phases. So we did two major things today. Uh, one, we went ahead and defined all of the phases so people know where they are in the priority. We are getting lots of questions and I think it's natural anxiety about, you know, where, where, where do I fall in the priority? And this is the priority that we're going to go in. And provided that people can uh, schedule, providers can schedule everybody in the group that we're working on, that's their job. You, you, you provide a vaccine to somebody in 1B before 1C. But the other thing we've done today is we have added a goal that would significantly increase the speed that people are being vaccinated of 90%. And we just want to recognize that when we put um, that, that immediacy on it, that there are going to be times when uh, different folks who are giving the vaccinations, whether they have cancellations, whether something happens, where these phases give clear guidance of, oh my goodness, I don't have enough 1B scheduled. You can go to 1C and then that next week you're back to 1B and everybody else you've scheduled. In other words, if that thing happened in the one store in Lexington and the one in Louisville, it's not hanging out a sign that says, uh, come get your vaccine. It is very clear instructions for how we're going to move through this. But knowing if we want to get 90% out within seven days, not going to be perfect. But that is the way we pick up our pace in vaccinations and protect uh, more of our people. All right, if that wasn't clear enough, we're going to have questions now. And I'm sure we can go over it again. We have a, a packed group on the line and also have some questions here. I'll start with one from the Bowling Green Daily News. Can you address concerns that have come from some practicing physicians who've experienced delays in receiving the vaccine? One in particular contacted us to relate her experience trying to get the vaccine. It seems not all physicians are getting the vaccine in a timely manner, particularly if they're not treating COVID patients regularly. Can you address the concern? So from the very beginning, we said it was gonna take until the end of January to get all of our healthcare professionals, the end of January. So a full another month was always the expectation based on how large uh, the, the, the group is. And we also have to make sure that we reach out uh, to, to all of those healthcare professionals. Now, certainly if you're not regularly treating COVID patients, we need the physicians and, and nurses and others that are uh, to, to go first. So again, if you're in, uh, if you're a physician or in the healthcare field, you're likely to get this within a month and a half of when the very first person on, on earth outside of clinical trial uh, got it. So, so please, we'll, we'll work really hard, make sure we get it to you by the end of January. Uh, but that's a heck of a timeline as compared to when others are, are likely to, to get it. But again, I understand you work in the healthcare area. Uh, you're certainly exposed to more. That's why you're in group 1A. Uh, Karen Zarr with WKY. Do we have Karen? Okay, we'll, we'll come back. I'm gonna make sure this isn't a technical difficulty. Uh, Shelby Smithson from WKYT. All right, we're gonna check our system as Virginia and I stare at each other awkwardly um, in the, the, the boxes of the screen. We're close, I'll read the other ones. Uh, uh, wave three, your response to a certain school district in the greater Louisville area that is not including AP courses and virtual learning option when in-person classes are set to begin January 11th. That is a requirement for in-person classes under an executive order. If you do not do it, you're not only in violation of that order, but you may be making immunocompromised kids come in because of what your what your uh, the pressure you're placing on their future to a place where they are not safe, we said we want to get schools open in red counties. To do that safely means those kids that um, it's not safe for them to come back to school, or those whose parents don't think it's safe, uh, don't lose out on educational opportunities. Whatever school district this is, and I don't know it, it's your responsibility. 
It's in the order. We expect you to live up to it. Uh, forward Kentucky, if a school system knowingly ignores or fails to meet CDC guidelines for doing in-person classes and a teacher, staff member, or student con contracts COVID, does that school system face a liability risk? Well, I think if you intentionally uh, fail to follow the CDC guidelines, then yes. Um, uh, whether whether you know, what what the mens rea is, in other words, the intentionality uh, would probably make that um, a little different in each situation. But uh, surely, even in this next legislative session, we're not considering eliminating liability for those who intentionally ignore and thus infect uh, people who are out there. Still working on it? Okay. The next one is, I'm seeking any details about how the state is planning to use the substantial inflow of eviction money that's part of the new COVID-19 bill. That's the CARES Act. We're working on it right now. The plan is to use the Kentucky Housing Corporation, which did an amazing job on our first eviction relief program. Uh, that's in process now, but we are still waiting on the federal government uh, for guidance as it comes out. Typically, they'll pass the bill, and then some certain period later, they'll provide different rules on how it has to, to, to go out. I'm really excited about that program. We're going to help a lot of people. One of the most important things, and we need the media's help, we need every county judge, we need all the organizations out there, is to inform everybody about this opportunity, especially when some people just get their, their news from email or, or social media. We want this program to get out there for everybody who, who needs it. All right, are we any closer? All right, we're getting there. Um, we got a question here about uh, Lexington Herald leader uh, confused about how vaccines are being rolled out, particularly because they're setting up a mass vaccination center in Louisville. So that mass vaccination center is only serving healthcare workers now. Uh, I do like that they have set it up because the volume is going to increase uh, over time. Uh, now, there, there has not been consistency uh, across all of the providers out there because it's hundreds that have gotten some vaccines to provide. That's a little natural, but we hope that providing uh, what we have done today and the urgency with it um, helps. Now, when you have this many people vaccinating other people, it's, it's, it's going to be a little messy uh, at times, but we hope that we can provide uh, clear advice. Some uh, groups have already moved into 1B categories like police officers and firefighters. I'll say there is significant overlap with EMT and EMS uh, with that group, but some have, have moved ahead uh, with that. Again, we hope that we can get all the healthcare workers uh, in that program done first, but now at least everybody knows what group comes next and what group comes after that. All right, now we set up, I think, the system we had the other week. Uh, I'm going to hear questions, uh, I think, out of a speaker. I don't think we're going to be able to hear them on the television, so I will repeat them so Virginia can, um, uh, can, can sign, and then we'll, we'll provide the best answers we can. So we'll go back to Karen Zarr from WUKY. Hi, Governor. Thank you, and Happy New Year to everyone. With, with the vaccine being delayed, is this going to affect the booster shots? And I know with the Pfizer, it's, a, it's at three weeks, Moderna's at four, but what is the window of opportunity for getting those boosters? Thank you. Uh, right now, the boosters should be on track. We've actually gotten uh, the first allocation uh, for the boosters from the first vaccinations uh, that went out. Uh, those providers that provided the, the first uh, shot of the vaccine will get the booster and will be responsible for getting those individuals vaccinated again. Uh, please make sure you get the booster shot. There's a lot of, of different things going around about how much of, um, uh, immunity you might get from the first one. Uh, the CDC tells us to take them both. The manufacturer tells us to take them both. Uh, and we all know what happens when you don't take medication uh, the prescribed uh, way. We, we think the booster shots are going to work well, but, but in, in planning, uh, when we think about when we reach 1C, for instance, that we showed earlier, how big that group is, well, we're also going to have people needing boosters at the same time. So the infrastructure we're building, we're going to have to be able to ramp up uh, even more. We're going to need some large-scale vaccination sites uh, across the Commonwealth. There's no question. 
Uh, Shelby Smithson from WKYT. Can they hear the questions now? Okay. Hi, Governor. Um, as far as the goal for the pace of vaccinating, when do you expect facilities to reach that immediately, or do you expect there will be some time to work up to that 90% in seven days? I believe it's, well, I want them to reach it immediately uh, because every day that goes by that somebody's not uh, vaccinated, again, is is more time that they could catch the virus before uh, their, their body prepares for it. So I, I'd like it to be hit this week. That's not realistic. Um, but, but I think within a couple of weeks, uh, certainly within three weeks, we expect everybody to get there. And if, if providers aren't getting there, then we are going to have to look at at other providers uh, to, to send it to. Again, that's not, uh, that's not suggesting anybody is doing it wrong, but it, it's the acknowledgement of the pace has to increase. And so for that, we need aggressive goals, but we also need accountability. If people understand the rules of the game, how they score points, I think they'll get out there and they will do it. Uh, Lee Searcy from WLEX. Yes, Governor, thank you. Um, Vaccination is obviously very important, but I have some unemployment questions to ask you. We at WLEX, we have received at least 2,000 emails just over the past week or so from people saying they're still waiting for their payments. How many claims remain unresolved as of today, total claims that you are aware of, and what can you tell people about when they will receive their payments or get some answers? So we're going to do a full update on unemployment this Thursday uh, because it'll include not only the, the numbers, which we'll, we'll send to you, uh, Lee. Certainly in March, they are very small now. Those are just the claims uh, that have some issues that we got to work through. Uh, April, a little larger, May, a little larger uh, than that. Um, there's certainly tens of thousands of claims that are still out there, and that's not okay. What you're going to hear Wednesday night in my um, State of the Commonwealth and budget address is there should be some relief and help on the way for those that have waited too long. For those that have been waiting months and there are no um, uh, identification problems, because we have to work through each and every one of those when you look at the amount of fraud that's occurring out there that happened in California or other places. Until we can verify identifications, you can't, you can't uh, uh, accept that claim and, and start providing payment. But for those individuals or those who, who lost out on, on extra $400 from the federal government because they made too little, I can't believe the federal government uh, put that in. There's, there's going to be some, some help on the way. Um, we're also going to provide an update on Thursday about changes that are coming to our unemployment uh, system, which desperately needs an overhaul. We're going to be able to make some in January, I believe. Uh, and then uh, we are scoring bids right now to provide a brand new system, something that should have happened uh, a decade ago. But our, our, our UI folks continue to work and to work hard to get through all these claims. This is what happens when you starve your safety net in, in good times and then you hit a historically bad time with a 1,300% year-over-year increase in, in unemployment claims. When you have 90-something fewer individuals because of past budget cuts, $16 million less going to the office and, and huge numbers of regional offices closed. Now, we can do a whole lot about that in the upcoming budget, and I, I'm, that's, that's exactly what we're going to be recommending and the type of action that we need to take. Uh, okay, now we have, and, and I apologize if I mispronounce um, your first name, uh, uh, Shemariah Morrison from WPSD Local 6. And if I did, please correct me. It's okay. Uh, it's Shemaria. <laughs> um, Shemaria, okay. My, uh, yeah, uh, okay, yeah, Shemaria from WPSD Local 6 here in Paducah. So my question is, uh, some states are seeing vaccine sites become super spreader events wide when they allow seniors to sign up for the vaccines. How will Kentucky avoid that? And do you have an exact date or month when those in the phase 1B 70 plus will be able to sign up for it? The way we avoid what we see in Florida, which are super spreader events, is to do this only by appointment. 
in Florida, they basically said, we're going to have this amount uh, in this place, first come, first serve, which created those huge lines. Now, we're only going to do this by very specific appointment to make sure that never happens. You should never have a super spreader event around the vaccine that's supposed to save you uh, from uh, that virus. We believe that we are going to be through 1A um, by the end of January, and we hope to beat that um, a little bit. 1B uh, should be somewhere between the last week of January or the end of the first week of February. We certainly want to hit a February uh, 1st deadline. And long before that, uh, we'll be providing, um, whether it's, it's regionally or statewide, uh, especially for those 70 and up, how you sign up. Because that's going to be a little different than K through 12, which is going to be assigned uh, a specific provider. Uh, so we, we will have those details. And again, it will be appointment only. And certainly, I want to see more drive-through sites. I am excited that Louisville is, is setting that up. Because again, that, that lessens the super spreading um, uh, ability if everybody's in their car. Now, we do have to address that there are a lot of Kentuckians that don't have a vehicle and a lot of seniors. So we're going to make sure that we have that um, addressed again uh, before we hit that sign-up period. Um, but if you're over 70, that opportunity uh, ought to be, uh, we hope, February 1st or a little bit earlier. Uh, Gil McClanahan from WCHS ABC8. Good afternoon, Governor. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, okay, good deal. I wanted to ask you a General Assembly question, which the session starts tomorrow. And a couple weeks ago, I counted nine pre-filed bills aimed at limiting executive authority. With the Republican supermajorities in both chambers, is there anything that you can do to stop that? And do you believe it will backfire on Republicans? Well, I believe that we are in the midst of a pandemic that is killing people. And uh, the more uh, limitations that a General Assembly wants to place on me that other states don't have leave us less equipped to fight the virus means we won't save as many lives, which means it'll take longer to defeat the virus, meaning it'll take longer to fully open our economy again to where our small businesses can have full capacity. Now, that, it'll take longer will be a direct result uh, of any bills passing that limit that authority. But what I'll also say is that the Supreme Court, uh, when they uh, cited in our favor in a unanimous decision uh, over the, the case filed by the Attorney General, talked about the constitutional nature of these powers. And I think we're sending a, a signal uh, that what the General Assembly may do could be unconstitutional. But let's look at what it also means. If, let's say, every month um, I have to call the General Assembly into special session when this pandemic is continuing. Well, there have been 10 months of this pandemic, and it cost, what, 60-something um, uh, thousand dollars a, a, a day? A day for a special session. For, for a special session. It lasts five days. So that's what, more than 300 grand? And we would have had to do it every month for 10 months. That's about $3 million just to continue uh, fighting the, the, the virus. And, and those, those, those costs are directly paid uh, to legislators. So I hope they, they really think that through, both in uh, the optics, but mainly in the real harm that it can do uh, to, to folks out there. And, and, and why do this in the midst of the pandemic? It's continuing. Let's get through it, and then we can have this conversation when people's lives aren't on the line. Tom Latek from Kentucky Today. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, I don't know if you want to take this or if this is more of a Dr. Stack uh, question, but uh, folks who have allergies, there are some who should not be getting the uh, vaccine. Can you uh, or the doctor tell me what those allergies are that folks shouldn't be getting uh, the vaccine? Yeah, let's, let's send that one to Dr. Stack. Uh, thank you, Tom and Governor. So the emergency use authorization says that people who have had severe 
uh, reactions to injectable vaccines or injectable medications should exercise increased caution uh, before receiving the vaccination. So that's a relatively small or tiny proportion of the general public. So if you have had serious reactions to injectable medications in the past, before you get your vaccination, make sure you discuss it with the healthcare providers who are at the vaccine site so that you can be properly informed and they can work with you on an individual basis to determine your risk and then recommend to you uh, what seems to be safest and in your best interests. And, and Governor, before I hand this to you, if you could identify on the slide we showed for the phasing, uh, it should have said greater than or equal to all those ages. So it's a minor change, but, and we've corrected the slide if you wanna reproject it, I think Scotty or James has that to show. Make sure this is included in, in the materials that people receive. Uh, Stu Johnson from WEKU. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. The, uh, as I already mentioned, the legislature is scheduled to come into session tomorrow. Uh, can't do much about the legislative calendar, uh, but are you comfortable with the timing right now with the pandemic and what's going to be the priority in terms of ensuring safety of everyone in the Capitol building for the session? I am concerned about uh, safety within um, parts of, of the Capitol. Certainly uh, within the first and, and second floor of the Capitol, which we directly control, uh, masks are required. Social distancing is required. Um, we've got limitations of individuals. I think it's 10 per floor that are gonna be allowed uh, in the Capitol at any time, uh, numbers that are gonna be able to use the rotunda, we feel good about the safety there. Now, obviously the legislature sets its own rules for who's gonna be in which of the chambers, what type of masking is, is gonna be required. Uh, now we have worked with them on um, some requests made specifically by Speaker Osborne on HVAC and other issues, and I, I think that that work has gone well, but I don't think that takes the place of the critical importance of masking and, and social distancing. Uh, I, I think it's gonna be um, incumbent on everybody to set the very best example and not to put others at risk. Uh, Ryan Van Velzer from WFPL. Thank you, Governor. Uh, a question for you and a question for Dr. Stack. For you, how many vaccines do you have to give out to public officials and former public officials? For Dr. Stack, uh, why have there been so few vaccinations in long-term care facilities, and what role can the state play in, in pushing that along, given that it's a federal contract with CVS and Walgreens? All right, so on the first question, uh, there is no question that there is vaccine hesitancy out there, that there are a number of individuals that are concerned about taking it. And as advised to us by the CDC and also by the research we've done, validators are incredibly important to building that confidence. If you look at legislative leadership, both Democrats and Republicans, doing it at the same time which we had today, it breaks down some of those walls that have been built up uh, on, on sometimes partisan grounds about whether or not you should take the vaccine. Uh, today, we had a bipartisan group of former governors that were vaccinated as well, each of them popularly elected by the people of this state that look to them for leadership that are known to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Kentuckians and, and governors who are still beloved by so many folks that put trust in them in different ways. This is how we reach individuals along with the program that we're gonna get going with faith leaders and others. If we cannot reach the percentages we need of people vaccinated, we don't get to immunity and we don't defeat COVID. So we can look at this cynically if you want, or we can do what it's actually gonna to take to get people vaccinated and to defeat COVID-19. Now that's my focus. Dr. Stack. So I think the governor has been very, very clear about this. The pace isn't fast enough. The pace needs to increase and we're committed to increasing the pace of vaccination. Now, I already listed a long array of things. I, 
I also am a little hesitant to throw entirely under the bus all the people who are trying to do this. We had two new vaccines come out within one week of each other. They're shipped as popsicles. They require special and bizarre handling conditions. All the clinical guidance was released at the same time. It was delivered to a healthcare workforce who has been taxed and really been responding to a crisis all year long. And they had to design systems to be able to deploy all of this and information kept changing. So I think there's a lot of reasons why, while it makes a wonderful narrative of a wonderful gift under the Christmas tree, it also makes the narrative of a really difficult time to roll out a big complex project. So um, I agree 100% with the governor. We got to pick up the pace. We're committed to picking up the pace and the pace will pick up. And I think we'll see that rapidly here over the next couple of weeks. All right, Morgan Watkins with the Courier Journal. Do we have Morgan? We'll, we'll come back. Uh, Daniel DeRocher from the Lexington Herald Leader. I have like uh, 50 questions, and so I'm going to try and cram them all into one for you. <laughs> um, okay. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, the, I'm I'm really kind of uh, fixated on this idea of, you know, this goal where you're getting to 90% here, right? Um, where you want to make sure that 90% of the vaccine is given out. Um, so, and and in parts, the, the first part is, I'm just very confused about that. How does that work? How do you pick the people? who are going to be able to help them get to 90%. How do people know when it's available? Do you want to, people to just kind of camp outside of Walgreens? Is it going to be by appointment online? How are they going to know when the appointments are available? Um, you know, and, and in that same vein, a lot of the elderly population that we're trying to reach may not be as computer savvy. Uh, and, and how do they kind of get access to this in a way that we avoid what's happened in Florida? And then in that same vein, you know, one of the things that, that Governor Mike DeWine said in Ohio is that he's seeing among long-term health care um, uh, providers that only 40% of staff were getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, do you know what our number is for the staff at the long-term facilities? And then how does it work when someone like staff passes up the vaccine? How do you figure out how it goes to the next person, which kind of applies to what you already said with the 90% goal? So that's how I'm tying them all in together. Sorry for asking you a million questions. So uh, our, our number isn't as bad as Ohio. We don't have an exact percentage, but we're working on it. Um, but there is a concerning number of long-term care staffers that are saying no right now. That doesn't mean that they're going to refuse to get it. Many of them want to wait and see. Um, as, as it's deployed. Now, if that's the case, they're going to fall into their age group or if they have one of the conditions in a later phase. So the 90% goal as it is right now, remember we are only in 1A. So we have established populations that it's supposed to go to. And in fact, we have names and places where they are, especially in hospitals. And so what this says to the hospitals or the, or the clinics that are getting it is, you know the healthcare providers in your area. This pace has to pick up. We want to see 90% in the, the seven days. And that's something that they can do the logistics on when the population is defined. So when we go through K through 12 schools, that'll be the same thing too. If we're going to ship to uh, provider X in county Y, it's of what's coming to you. 90% needs to get into those school personnel, whether they go to the school or have the school come to them or work with the superintendent, it still sets a clear goal when you know who the individuals are and they've already done that planning. Now, when we hit those over 70 or over 60, it is going to be a bigger challenge. And so we're working right now to establish the partnerships uh, and the signups that it's going to take at that point. Um, certainly, it is likely to be uh, online and over the phone, and we will at least need a phone option. And the goal there is to lessen the amount of time when you show up to a scheduled appointment, because we are not going to simply put a sign on a door and have a line. We are not doing that. When you show up to an appointment, the more work that can be done ahead of time, 
in your paperwork, in uh, the questions that you need to be asked before you get it, the faster we can provide the, the vaccines themselves. So uh, those over 70, again, that's going to be uh, right around the beginning of February. And we certainly are going to regionally by that time have uh, the easiest way to sign up and multiple ways to sign up. But it is going to be a by appointment where they can verify your age beforehand, get you in and get you out in the most uh, efficient way uh, possible. And again, that's going to mean that if we ship a significant amount uh, to an area, they have got to have, uh, think about our testing. Right? Think about uh, the difference between how when we were doing the state lab and a couple of other places, and when we went to the Kroger drive through how dramatically different uh, that was, what the capabilities were. We need to make that same jump, but we need to make it uh, faster. We need to make it without the bugs. We need to make it uh, with everything that we learned on, on the testing front, where you could really uh, get people uh, through at a designated time in a designated place. And it's gonna take uh, a couple weeks for us to get all those specific details. But what we learned in testing is we don't wanna open up the way right now when you can't get it until uh, February because people end up canceling those appointments uh, over time. Melissa Patrick for Kentucky Health News. Do we have Morgan? Hi, Governor. Um, so the uh, seven-day rolling average of new cases uh, is showing us upward trajectory, which should be no surprise. But can you, um, what are your epidemiologists saying about what to expect in the coming weeks? Are, the, are you expecting them to keep going up or are you expecting them to flatten out like they did after Thanksgiving? Well, what our epidemiologists are, are waiting on is, is, is the two things that we, we talked about. One is to see how much of this last week is is attributable to maybe cases that that uh, weren't reported up over at least that first holiday weekend versus how much of it is based on gatherings in and around the, the holidays uh, that we've had. Our epidemiologists certainly believe that some of it is based on on the holiday. And so I think what that means is what happened after the holiday? You know, did people get tested? Are they getting tested or are they going out and spreading the, the virus even more? Are they going to go back to not gathering in those informal settings after maybe that one time they got together with extended families or friends? So I think it is uh, really dependent on behavior now after those gatherings. Is it behavior that spreads uh, or is it a return to, to being more careful? Um, if, if this is a significant impact uh, from the holidays, I would expect to see an increase over at least a couple of weeks. If people's behavior then reverts back to um, being more careful about the virus, then hopefully we would see a leveling out or a decrease. And that's, again, that's, that's looking at all the, the scenarios. We're going to have to see it bear out um, in, the, in the data. Uh, John Charlton for WHAS, and then we'll go back to Morgan Watkins. Thank you, Governor. Happy 2021 to you. Um, you touched on unemployment earlier in the press conference, and you also talked about Ernst & Young. I believe their contract is, is expiring this week. Correct me if I'm wrong. And what are the plans moving forward with EY? Uh, are you looking to extend the contract? And <clears throat> is there any proof that they're actually being effective? And they have been effective, um, and, and they put together uh, numbers for that. There's no question uh, that they've helped us process uh, claims, and we'd be in a much worse place uh, without them. They've even been able to do some um, of the, the letters that hold us back, um, uh, that, that make some uh, adjudication, and then uh, move it uh, forward to appeal. Uh, whether or not we extend the contract is a conversation we want to have uh, with the legislature as well. Right now, we don't have a plan um, to re-up it immediately. And what we'd like to see is what is possible uh, early in this year and in the next um, budget on getting there. Now, I hope 
I hope that all of our branches of government are committed to resolving this problem. And I think that they are. Now, whether or not we can um, get together and, and plan how this doesn't happen in the future, restore some of those cuts, get things right, uh, whether we can do that or whether we just fight with each other, I certainly hope uh, that we can do that. And we're going to work really hard on this side uh, to try to make that happen. Uh, we, we, we continue um, to, to work through claims. And I just remind people, it's not just those initial claims you see and you say, well, if you're working a certain number every day, how do they not go down um, at a different pace? We're also helping people who qualified were getting um, their, their unemployment payments and then made a mistake because the system's set up to kick people out. It is set up for people to make mistakes. It's set up to frustrate people so they quit. It's set up in times like this to overwhelm the people that are, are working on it. It's set up to try to pay out as little as possible, and that's wrong. But I think we may have some bipartisan support for changing that uh, moving forward. Hopefully that's a, a lesson learned and something we can do together. Uh, Morgan Watkins from the Courier Journal with our last question. All right, I think we lost Morgan. We'll, we'll answer uh, your question if you'll submit it to us. Again, everybody, happy 2021. A lot going on in Frankfurt this week. Our short session begins. We have to pass a budget in it. Uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, I'll be providing the state of the Commonwealth and the budget address in one. And while you'll have to wait until then to, to hear the specific details, let me say the first part of 2021 is going to be tough. It's going to be tough because of this virus. It's going to be tough because we're going to lose more people. But we're going to defeat this virus this year. And what you'll see in, in my address is we've got a lot of opportunity to grab right now. Post-COVID world, the post-COVID economy, and who leads it is based on decisions that we're going to make as we come out of this. We can either be bold, act with courage, create our own future, take it in our hands, and lead this state where we need to go, create the amazing jobs of the future, or we could be timid and we can watch this opportunity pass us by when some other state takes it and provides a better life to their kids. As long as I'm your governor, I'm gonna fight for the very best life for all of our citizens and to provide more opportunity for my kids and for yours. We'll see you tomorrow at four.